Hello everybody, it's Yvonne Silva with Flourish and I'm delighted to be here today with the lovely Dahlia Mustafa and I've been waiting to have a chance to interview Dahlia for a number of weeks. She's been a crazy, crazy busy girl doing all sorts of interviews, speaking engagements, uh, setting up new programs, uh, working with the general public in her chosen area and I just read a lovely article um, uh, just posted, I guess, in the last couple of days even for Migrant Magazine, and it describes you as a uh, woman, the most inspiring woman in Canada, is what it said. And it was a lovely article, so congratulations on that. I think that, that was a great celebration of some of the amazing accomplishments that you have had throughout your career and I'm so delighted that you decided to come to Canada was it 13 years ago now 13 years ago yes yeah to share your wisdom and to share some of your um, extensive education your experiences and of course your beautiful heart to share that with Canadian citizens I was actually just at the Canadian uh, sorry the Calgary Immigrant Women's Association last Friday talking with some new immigrants as well, ladies, and sharing on, um, we talked about emotional intelligence and uh, career advancement. Uh, lovely, lovely group. So welcome. I, um, I wanted to also um, let our audience know, if you're not familiar with Dahlia, which would be hard because she's been in the press and been the award recipient for numerous awards over the past few years. She is an Egyptian, born Canadian professional certified master life coach. So she works as a marriage and youth counselor, but she's also doing more than that, much more. She's a leadership consultant and trainer. She's got uh, over 15 years of experience. And her, her baby, if you like, is the uh, Canadian Life Transformation Academy, which she's the president and CEO of. And this is something that is a lovely combination of your experiences, both helping people with uh, family, with marital, with youth, um, personal development, leadership, um, opportunities and growth areas. But you have an interesting background too. You started as an electrical engineer. Can you, can you summarize? Tell me a little bit more about how you move from that career into what you're doing right now. Well, I did. I wanted to start with psychology, but long time ago in Egypt, psychology was kind of a taboo. So my dad refused me going to psychology. There was this notion in the Egyptian culture that if you work with people who have psychological problems, you end up with psychological problems. So he was like, honey, I don't want you to be there. So, so I, I chose to be an engineer. My dad was an engineer. I was so passionate about engineering, mathematics. I, I find actually that mathematics and organizational skills are the foundation of how the brain functions. So I was so passionate about it. So I went for engineering, finished my undergrad, was appointed as an assistant lecturer in the university, was the top of my class all throughout the years. Then I started my master's degree, finished my master's, became an assistant lecturer. And then I actually came to Montreal to pursue my PhD in electrical engineering. Uh, within a short duration, six months, then I was honored with the Alexander Graham Bell Award in research, which is the most prestigious Canadian award by that time in research and engineering and that was a true honor and then Bombardier tried, tried to recruit me within six months uh, in the industrial field and I was always passionate to go and see how industry will be because I've been kept in academia all my life <laughs> I was like I wanted to feel that I'm an engineer in real life so I wanted to take the job offer of Bombardier it was a dream of course for, for any person my age and my mom said, honey, like, you need to finish your PhD. I'm afraid if you go to industry, you're never going to come back to finish your PhD. So I declined the job offer of Bombardier. And then six months later, Sunker Energy recruited me from Calgary. And the job offer was too good really to be refused. And I was just like a bird who was ready to fly and see <laughs> how industry is. I wanted to go and gain hands-on experience in industry and then decide later on if I want to be in the industry or go back to academia. So I joined Suncor, relocated, and then after being five years in Suncor, uh, team lead in reliability engineering, I said, what's the point of having my PhD in engineering now? Let's switch it to what I'm really working on, which was leadership, team yep. building, and so on. So I deviated the engineering from PhD in engineering to PhD 
in leadership policy and change. And I chose my focus as counseling psychology just to revive the old green bag that I had since I was <laughs> Lovely. What a fabulous story. And I'm, I'm so glad. Thank you, Suncor, for bringing Dahlia <laughs> to Calgary. Um, certainly, you've been um, able to very nicely blend your academic experience and all of your uh, PhD studies and bring that into a very practical use. And now you're helping a lot of different um, individuals, couples, you're working in that psychology and counseling area with Click uh, Coaching and Consulting. And people are noticing you have, I, I've lost track of how many awards you have. What's the count? It's 41 now. I'm going for the 42nd in Toronto uh, in 10 days. The, the, 40, the, 40, the 41st was the Fearless Woman of Inspiration Award. And it was really, it meant a lot for me because really most of my work is really to inspire people, empower them, motivate them, let yeah. them shine, right? Through their careers, through their life, through their relationships, stuff like that. So it was, it was really a meaningful milestone for me. Mm. The upcoming award is also very meaningful because it's from the Canadian Arab Women Club. So it's, it's something really interesting. It's a Lifetime Achievement Award and, member, and, and an honorary membership, and it will be in Toronto. So I'm so excited, actually, to go and join. They're doing a big party for the International Women Day, and they're doing it on March the 10th in Toronto. So I'm very excited to be there and with <laughs> all these beautiful, amazing women, right? It's, it's such another milestone as well. So many, so many synergies I'm sensing because I first met you at the Women of Inspiration nominees lunch that was yes. actually around um, Stampede last year. And I had actually been on the judging committee for the Canadian Business Chicks Women of Inspiration um, Awards. And I had looked at all of the nominations and I had picked out a few people that I particularly wanted to meet. You were one of those people, not to say that I didn't want to meet everybody because I did, However, it was just serendipity when you sat down at my table. <laughs> so lovely. And talking of the Fearless uh, Conference, the Fearless Summit, when you're in Toronto, I'll be on stage in Edmonton. Uh, yes, as a fearless woman of inspiration, right? Yeah, I think I'm actually first up even in the morning. So <laughs> lots of synergies. So I, I am pleased that you're able to join because I sense that you have quite a lot that you could share on the topic of confidence. So I prepared some questions because otherwise we could be here for the whole afternoon and I know we don't have that much time. So what is it, do you believe, that is, for women in particular, what are the roots of confidence? How do we get it and how do we keep it? Can we start there? Yeah, I think that the root for confidence is really two, two main things, self-worth and identity. Mm. It's very important for one to shape their identity, how they are seeing themselves and how do they present themselves to the world. Mm. What are those qualities they believe they have? What is their vision about the world? Mm -hmm. How do they stand up in the public and talk about themselves? Right. Are they talking in a positive tone? Are they talking in a negative tone? What is their story like? It's very important for people to learn that this story hasn't been engraved. It's just a story. They are the one who say it, and they have the power to change it as they go on. So the more the story is positive, the more the, sc the story is descriptive, the more the story really describes their true essence, who they really are, mm. the more people become confident about themselves. The more they know that they are good enough, the more they value themselves. So... Right. Remember, I said self-worth, identity, and value. Yeah. That all, for me, is really the foundation of confidence. Mm. It's interesting. I don't know if you had a chance to read. Yesterday, I just posted an, an excerpt from Chapter 7 in the book, and I'm exploring different words and underutilized words, negative words, positive words, words that elevate our confidence and words that deplete it. And finally, we actually have, you know, cover and I love the cover it's real yes <laughs> thank you um but the excerpt was talking about the word negotiate and obviously for women that's a powerful one and at the end I have action steps and one of my action steps was to 
have a morning mantra which says, I am worthy. Yeah. Directly connects to what you just shared. So thank you for that. <clears throat> so my belief is that we have confidence. We're born with confidence. If we think about, you know, toddlers that are learning how to walk, they get up, they fall down, they get up, they fall down. You know, if, if they got up and never got up again um, because they'd fallen down, I mean, nobody would be learning to walk, right? So yeah. my belief is that we do have we all have confidence inside us, but sometimes the layers of life experience, depending on how negative they are or how we grow up, our parents, etc., showcasing or not very good role models, perhaps, those layers gradually get so thick that people forget that they have confidence inside and it gets buried. I'm interested in your perspective on that. Well, I totally agree with this, you know, layers of fears, like fears of itself, fear of judgment, fear of failure, fear of disappointing other. So the layers of fears on its own, it's really decreased the confidence. The disappointment that people encounter over life as they are pursuing their life over and over and over and over also contributes to decreasing their confidence. Right. The culture where people grew up, you know, there are family who empower confidence and instill confidence in their children. And unfortunately, there are other families who are the decision makers especially in lots of cultures from different backgrounds, there are families who want to be the decision maker, thinking they are choosing the best for their children and their youth, although they are actually shaking their confidence. So confidence really, you know, the more you instill confidence in youth, the more youth have the time and the knowledge and the tools to practice confidence, the more this confidence really becomes sacred when they go. It's, it's there. They can always rely on it. They can always drain from it so fear of judgment fear of disappointment fear of failure sometimes fear of success all these things you know shake do shake confidence from the root yeah and your father sounded as though he was such a strong supporter of what what it was you wanted to do um my father was not he was a uh, in the war, Second World War, he got hit by a bullet in Dunkirk. He came back with PTSD. And I just thought he was really, really angry. And, um, you know, he, he even told me at age 11 that I would never, ever be successful in life. I'm 11. I'm about to go into junior high. Thanks. And that was what was the root of me striving. And, you know, I'm darn well going to prove you wrong for so many years. And then finally having a, um, yeah, in essence, it was, um, I mean, burnt out basically by, by striving so much. And that was when my company, the new company, Flourish, was born. Born with a whole different energy. You talked about negative words and positive words. And that's what this is really all about is, what are some of those lower vibrational words? What are some of the words that will elevate you so that you can have those integrated into your day and not be using words that belittle like, um, like just, or even saying, sorry, you know, I, I, I encourage my clients now don't say sorry. And, um, and I know that there are experiences where they, they feel the need to apologize. However, if they own it, and just respond and say, hmm, that's interesting. That didn't work out the way I thought. I fully uh, take responsibility for that. I trust I may be forgiven. I know that's a lot more words than saying sorry, but it just has a whole different positive energy behind it. And Absolutely. Stand with their shoulders back when they say yeah. that. Instead oh, sure, it's very important. Yeah, the head hanging down. So these are the kinds of concepts that I put together in the book because I – found that I was telling the same stories and the same examples with clients over and over and over again. And uh, it was time to get that out into the, the world because what I thought was common sense and common knowledge apparently wasn't. So yeah, I'm, I'm so pleased that you're starting with youth because I do a lot of work with women who are closer to my age. And of course, we've got a lot more layers to peel off mm -hmm. and a lot more deep diving to do. And depending on when we get connected, they may or may not have done a lot of inner work before they come with, uh, you know, come with a, an expectation of how we can make a big shift. So with yourself, you're working with youth 70% um, more than adults or? No, actually, no. I work with youth, I would say 30%. Okay. 70%. I would say youth 30%, seniors 20%, and 50% is adults. 
Hmm, interesting. Yeah. We talked about the roots of confidence. So um, in terms of ways that if you didn't have a great upbringing, because obviously a lot of psychology is sort of looking, you know, backwards at what, how, you, how you were shaped, how can you make a significant shift now to really start owning your confidence, particularly for women, not in a, uh, an energy of male striving, but in a authentic feminine way? I think the power of the word I am is very important. Mm. And whatever we put after the word I am is really important. Yes. So a few things, I am able, I am capable, mm. I'm skillful. So if we instill the positive beliefs inside that I am able, I can do that, yeah. that will boost the confidence. Yeah. And if we adhere this and add to it more skills, because skills is always going to reinforce our capabilities. There is a difference when someone come on stage and they don't know how to give a presentation in terms of public. Totally different than when someone rehearsed before and learned some hands-on tip how to give presentation in terms of public. So the more that we have, we're framing the idea itself in the brain. The idea is there instilled positively. And then we are anchoring this with the skills needed and the capability itself. Yeah. So these two angles would really take the confidence of a person of a person to a high new dimension. Mm. It's, it's interesting because as you know, I have a, you know, HR background as before my executive coaching certification. So um, I I've seen this firsthand, but certainly reading up on quite a bit of research around women and confidence and being in the workplace, women tend to get judged very much on our past accomplishments. Yes. Whereas men tend to get evaluated for a promotion based on their future potential. Mm -hmm. And if we look at some of the work from the um, Center for Creative, uh, Center for Creative Leadership, CCL, um, some of their PhD research was all around women who are wanting to retain other women. And what are some of the key contributors that are going to be meaningful for women to be trusting other women and the leaders in the workplace. And it was around competence, uh, competence, consistency, and caring. So again, it's back to, you know, how do we showcase that we have the skills and are fully competent in whatever level of work it is that we're doing. And also how do we articulate that we can be consistent and we can be caring. So we're integrating the opinions of others which of course is a key trait for great leadership. Yes. Yeah. So for women leaders, any other thoughts on how they can really show up authentically with their own personality and still be in strength and as a, a strong beacon of hope as a leader? You know, for women's leader, it's very important for them to stay on the narrow path. And life is really busy, you know, life now with all the drama that happens in the world, family responsibilities, work responsibilities, we're all trying to balance between our family, our career, our yeah. personal well-being as well. So, so many things can pull up away from the narrow path of success or the narrow path of our goals. So the more time we are determined, we have perseverance, we remain focused on the goal, stay on the narrow path. Minimize any time that we spend outside of the narrow past, the more our confidence gets generated. Because from one accomplishment to one accomplishment, to one goal that we achieve to another, the confidence just keeps being built over and over and over. Until you really reach a stage, you know that you can do it. Sometimes we still doubt it until now. Sometimes we still get butterfly before going into a big conference when there is 10,000 people in the room. But you actually, everyone around you would tell you, Yvonne, you can do that. I'm sure that you're going to nail it and you're going to do it very well, right? But for <laughs> you, you still have these feelings, right? So the more you are assertive to yourself, the more you say, yes, I can do it. Yes, I have the abilities. Yes, I have been practiced. The more you are focused on the narrow path, the more that you are committed, the more seriously there is good intention, there is hard work, the more the confidence is just going to keep increasing and you're just going to be on the right track to blow and shine your confidence and have it infectious around everyone around you. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great advice. Um, I feel like you're talking to me 
personally in this, which is, <laughs> so, you know, there's lots of other women that are going to be seeing this interview that aren't necessarily speakers at this point in time. And I was lucky enough early on to interview um, Karen McGregor as well. From yes, I, uh, I've read that. Formula. And certainly the whole piece about authenticity is, you know, is such a, um, a core element of of having that message being conveyed. So I will take all of those tips, thank you very much, and roll those in with my March uh, work. Now, I know that you have a, another appointment. You're a crazy busy lady. Um, I did, however, want to invite, um, if there's any last comments that you had on that topic of confidence, anything that you wanted to share, or if you have an upcoming event or something that um, you'd like to mention, this would be the time to do it. I just want to add that the more that people tune off, it's like a radio station. So the more people tune the volume down and dial down their own criticism, their own critique, their own doubt about their confidence, the more actually they become confident. And I would love to take that offer and that opportunity and announce that on March 5th, there is going to be an award being launched by the Canadian Life Transformation Academy. It's called the Arab Woman of Excellence Award. Mm -hmm. It's an award for North American women from Arab heritage. It's the first award ever of its kind. And it is to honor and celebrate the achievement of 100 Canadian and American women from Arab background. And uh, really, the whole point of it is to show that there is, I've noticed, as you kindly mentioned, in all the awards I have been through, the last year it was nine awards. I was always the only Arab woman on the platform. And I know that there are amazing potential and amazing Arab women in politics, industry, business, government, academia, research, teaching, motherhood, inspirational, community service. So this award is for them. It's going to help create a platform to help mentorship between the successful ones, the newcomers. It's going to help as well to blend and integrate more between those women from Arabian heritage and those more women from Canadian and American background to help have a more productive, uh, flourishing, prosperous, and integrated mm -hmm. Canada and America as well. Mm -hmm. So I would like, if anyone know any woman from an Arab heritage that they would like to nominate it, it's going to be on the website www.lifetransformationacademy.org slash awards. And again, nominations are going to start on March 5th for one month until April 5th. Okay, lovely. So I will make sure that that website address is linked when I post the interview. And sure. I've had a, I've, I found this very insightful. With your permission, I would like to be able to post this and share sure. insights with other people. And there's some nuggets here that directly connect to some of the content and expand even on what I have in the book already. So with your permission, I would like to potentially include some of these comments. Sure, please. It would awesome. be my pleasure, Yvonne. Awesome. So um, I'm glad that you are celebrating that particular um, focus. This book cover actually came about, I had the original picture and it was obviously of a Caucasian blonde lady. And it was after I interviewed Jenny Gulamani, Jenny Abdullah Gulamani, the BPW national president, that I realized, oh shoot, I make, better make sure that I am covering diversity a little bit better when I put the book cover together. So thank you for putting the spotlight on that and for the amazing work that you're doing. Such a beacon of hope for women. And I am looking forward to, maybe we can follow up and have lunch sometime when you have five minutes. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I'm just busy though, as I'm, you know, like it's my full coaching counseling practice, my life transformation academy, the family, the baby, and the award, of course, is taking lots of time. But once the nominations start to be open, it's going to be the judging committee who's going to handle that. And I guess I'm going to have like a good time to spend with nice, amazing friends like you, Eva. Okay, well, we'll book it maybe for May. <laughs> yes. <laughs> have a lovely day. Thank you so much. And take care, Dahlia. My pleasure. And thank you for having me in this beautiful interview. Best wishes for all your amazing work that you're doing. You're helping women flourish, blossom, and connect more with themselves. And I so much, so much, so much honored and delighted to be in your interview today and in the book. Thank you, Eva. Thank you so much, Dahlia. Okay. Bye-bye.